Hello and welcome. In lesson 8, we will be focusing on how magnetic forces impact moving charges. Our goal is to explore the various types of motion that charges in movement exhibit within uniform magnetic fields. We'll begin by providing a short introduction. Following that, we'll explore scenarios where the charge velocity aligns either parallel or perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. Finally, we'll see an example to solidify our understanding. In our previous session, we determined that the magnetic force acting on a moving charge experimentally obtained is proportional to the charge value times the magnitude of velocity and magnetic field and the sine of the angle between these vectors. Mathematically, this was expressed as shown. We also explored specific scenarios. When V was parallel to the magnetic field, the force was null, and when V was perpendicular, the force reached its maximum magnitude. In this class, our focus will be understanding the types of motion these charges exhibit in these two scenarios. We will start with the case where the velocity of the charge is parallel to the magnetic field. That is, V parallel to B. When V aligns parallel to B, the force becomes zero due to the vector product of these two vectors. With zero force, the acceleration vector diminishes to zero as well, resulting in a constant velocity vector. In such a scenario, the particle's motion will follow a path of uniform and rectilinear movement. Let's move on to the second case. The second case we are going to analyze is that the velocity of the charge is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and this magnetic field is uniform. Let's consider that the initial velocity of the charge goes in the direction of the y-axis with positive sense and the magnetic field is a uniform one aligning along the z-axis. Therefore, V times B determines the direction of the force which aligns with the x-axis. As there's no component acting on the z-axis, the charge is forced to move within the xy plane. Let's examine a trajectory and select a generic point along it for analysis. At that generic point, the velocity will have to be tangent to the curve at that point. We've assumed a uniform magnetic field vector pointing along the z-axis. Moreover, the force exerted will be perpendicular to the tangent to the curve at that point. With these chosen axes, we'll consider the force in line with the second principle of dynamics. This principle states that the sum of forces equals the mass multiplied by acceleration. We'll project onto an axis tangent to the curve aligned with the direction of velocity vector and another axis perpendicular to the curve at that point representing the direction of the force. In the direction of the tangent, no forces are acting. Thus, the equation becomes zero equals the mass multiplied by the tangential acceleration. Remember, the tangential acceleration represents the derivative of the velocity magnitude concerning time. In the perpendicular direction, we observe the force which equates to the mass multiplied by the normal acceleration. The force, in magnitude, defined as the charge times velocity times the magnetic field vector, equals the mass multiplied by the normal acceleration represented as V squared times rho, where rho stands for the radius of curvature, as we've discussed previously. From these two equations, let's examine the implications. The first equation suggests that if the derivative of the velocity magnitude concerning time equals zero, the velocity magnitude remains constant and equals V sub zero, which represents the initial velocity of the charge. From the second equation, if we isolate rho, it equates to the mass multiplied by velocity divided by the product of charge and magnetic field. Given that all velocity, magnetic field, mass, and charge are constant, 
the radius of curvature remains constant as well. Consequently, the particle will undergo a motion that's both uniform and circular. In another scenario, when V and B are neither parallel nor perpendicular but form an angle alpha, the particle will trace a helical path. However, this topic won't be covered in this class. Having seen this, let's move on to an example. Yota is presenting a schematic of a device known as a mass spectrometer, depicted right here. Particles of mass m and charge q come out of the particle source without initial velocity. These particles are accelerated by the difference in potential difference in v and enter a magnetic field shown here which directs upwards perpendicular to the plane of the screen. The particles describe a circular orbit whose radius depends on b, the increment of v, m, and q. By measuring the radius of the orbits, it is possible to calculate the ratio m over q of the particles, which allows to identify and separate them, since they all enter at point P1. But leave through P2, leave through P2, which is different according to m, divided by q. We're tasked with determining the velocity of the particles entering the field B through P1. Additionally, it's specified that two ions of nickel isotopes, each with a charge, equivalent to that of the electron but positive and differing masses, nickel 58 and nickel 60, are emitted. The magnetic field strength is noted as 0.12 teslas, and the potential difference is 3,000 volts. The question then asks us to compute the radius of each orbit. Isotopes are atoms of the same element with differing numbers of neutrons, resulting in distinct masses for each. This distinction is what allows us to differentiate between point P, 2 in each case. Now, let's return to the problem at hand. Work equates to the product of charge and potential difference, and simultaneously equals the change in kinetic energy. Considering the expression for kinetic energy, we can isolate the velocity from the obtained expression. It's evident that the velocity is a function of the charge, the potential difference, and the mass. Therefore, using this approach, we can determine the velocity. To calculate the orbit's radius, theoretically, we use the formula mass multiplied by velocity divided by the particle's charge times the value of the magnetic field. By substituting the expression for velocity obtained in the previous section, we can compute the radius of the orbit. The charge, in the case of nickel 58 and nickel 60, is the same and the only difference will be the mass. Remember, we were provided with the values for the magnetic field, the potential difference, and the charge. In the case of nickel 58, where the mass was 9.62 times 10, raised to minus 26 kilograms, substituting this value into the expression yielded a radius of 500.5 millimeters. For nickel 60, with a mass 9.95 times 10, raised to minus 26 kilograms, the resulting radius is 509.5 millimeters. These calculations indicate the radii for both cases are different, and therefore the point 2 that will reach 1 and the other will be different, which will allow us to differentiate whether it is an isotope 58 or 60. In this class, we've observed that when a charged particle's velocity aligns parallel to the magnetic field, it undergoes uniform rectilinear motion. Conversely, when the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field, the particle follows a path of uniform circular motion. That concludes our lesson for today. See you in the next class.